This is episode 160? Maybe. I don't know. This person looks like Jen Ketty. She looks like her. I mean, she's in civilian clothes, but we're going to find out, okay? The episode yeah. starts right now. Let's do it. So check it out. Looking for an indoor player? We got you covered. This person's like first team All-American in the Big West. She also cut her teeth playing overseas. Looking for a beach player? We got you covered. Not only is she an outdoor savage at the net like a cave troll, you got to pay money just to cross a bridge. She won the AVP, the last one in Florida. Ladies and gentlemen, Jen Ketty. Ketty, what's up? What's up? Thanks for having me. <laughs> hey, got to give the people what they want. Got to give the people what they want. I didn't sing the song Absolutely. today, and I think I think I'm gonna owe you one for that. So let's actually erase that. Let's go to split screen, and bam, there we are. What's good? What have you been up to? Where are you coming from? You know, I am currently in Missoula, Montana. This is where I'm from. Was born in California, raised in Montana. I moved here when I was super young um the it's gonna be minus 17 this week supposedly mm. so a little different from uh the austin texas weather where you live yep uh, but yeah i'm just here for christmas break and literally trying not to think about volleyball but it's like after winning you're like oh my gosh i want more so i'm trying to have a little break here yeah honestly i think and i think i speak for many players sometimes when you're into the training and the physical preparation and the mental and all that stuff, taking a small patch of your time and doing nothing is, is the way to go. It's golden. I'm good at, dude, I'm totally good at doing nothing. <laughs> all right. You good at doing nothing? <laughs> Hold on. Where's oh. my camera? Y'all good at doing nothing? I'm good. Well, I'm good at doing nothing. We're, we're good at doing nothing. All right. <laughs> I'm terrible at doing nothing. I literally want to work out every day, yeah. which I, I don't know. Yeah, me, yeah, me no, dude, my, let me tell you something. My wife, she's like a shark. If she stops moving forward, she'll die. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah. So, I, I listen, I, t I, and when it comes to the women I like to talk to, I have the right selection. I think I pick them all wisely. So, once again, ladies and gentlemen, this is episode 160. I'm 90% sure it's 160. My producers are going to tell me later, are you are right or wrong. This is Jen Ketty. This is Jen Ketty. We, we got a lot to talk about. I mean, she's got an indoor, outdoor experience, but for me, allowed me to go uh, present from present to past a little bit. And we'll jump back and forth. Um, I'm gonna steer us close, off, as close off the cliff as we can, and then you grab the wheel and you can steer us back on. Okay. Perfect. Let's take you back to the recent past and not the distant past. I bring your attention to the AVP in Florida. It, it was Fort Lauderdale, Saint Petersburg, Central Florida. Tavares. How do you say that? Tavares. It was like Central yeah, Florida, Open, Tavares. Tavares. That's like a MMA fighter's Tavares. name. <laughs> you know, yeah. I hear Tavares and I'm like, wait, that's the guy who yeah. fought Israel out of Sonya like two years ago in the UFC. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. And a guy who's impossible to knock out, by the way, for my UFC fans. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Um, I just said talking. Y'all know where I'm from. <laughs> I know. I just heard the accent. <laughs> and it's cold there, too. <laughs> and I lived on the Hudson. So. So Ooh. that so the wind bouncing off that water, your yep. dude, your boogers freeze. It's just yep. yeah. She's like, I know about that. Yeah, that's that's cold. Yeah. Off the water, that's cold. So you hooked up with Khan with was it is it Khan or Khan? Khan. Khan. I like her. She Hawaii product. Um I think she played indoor at Missouri and then ended up um playing for Evan at um well Evan was the assistant coach that then he's the head coach now at Hawaii Beach at University mm -hmm. of Hawaii. A New Yorker, yeah. by the way, Long Island guy, and um, oh. and an absolute mensch. So I'm glad I got that job. Um, I'm okay. talking too much. I need you. I need you to. Um, let me just present a question like this. Here's my question. All right, you you guys trained probably none, probably a, a week before. You just like got on the court and played Rafa Rodriguez style. Um, yeah. You get to the finals, evenly matched team. You got Gina Urango and Emily. Capers. I can't say it. <laughs> it's capers now. Damn it, you're a day, woman. You're a day. <laughs> All right, come see me. Um, yeah. Actually, I thought it was a pretty evenly matched, uh, you know, um, contest. First set, you guys win. Um, 
pretty, I'd say relatively confident fashion as far as levels of competition is concerned, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, second set, you know, they get a lead, they play a little keep away ball, then they realize volleyball is not keep away ball. You can't wait till a clock hits three zeros. You actually have to get to 21, and they did. And then the third game. So here's my question, and I'm finally going to let you talk. Everyone was like, shut up, Jason. Um, you're one set of piece. You're sitting with, with Lady Khan. Um, what conversation did you have before the third set started? You know, it's going to sound crazy. And I think like the comments I got afterwards were like, oh my gosh, you guys looked so calm. Like I would have never guessed this was your first finals. Like would have never guessed you guys haven't played together. Mm. Honest to God, the whole weekend and a lot of this, like I'm sure you've heard, you know, the story about me being like, how funny would it be if we won this whole thing? You know, like joking. Cause you know, you say things like that, but you're not like, okay, yeah. And I just like kept saying it. I was like, dude, we're going to win this thing. And I, you know, in the finals at no point, this is going to sound, it's going to sound crazy. I get it. At no point was I like, oh, we're going to lose. Like literally it was just so, we were both so calm and just like, Hey, like let's play volleyball. Mm. And the conversation we had was, Hey, the pressure's not on us. Like no one expected us to come here and win this whole thing. Like no one expected us to be in the finals. Like we're just like, let's just go play volleyball in this third set. Yeah, I think there's something liberating about that too, yes. uh, of having of uh, the feeling that you're playing with house money. Yeah. Right. You're like, it's it's like someone giving you fifty grand and saying go into Vegas and say go gamble, go gamble. It's not, yeah. and you're there and you're like, wait, this isn't my money. <laughs> yeah. No, and I mean we hadn't practiced. We had like we she just slid into my dms and was like hey i think we can get in with points like do you want to try and i was like sure not really thinking that we would and so i had kind of checked out for the season and she asked me and i was like okay yeah and then we get in and i'm like oh my gosh i i haven't been practicing um and we literally we just had no expectations going in we were like like let's just go have fun and play volleyball last tournament of the season and I think because we had no expectations and we literally were just going for fun, it was, we were just relaxed the whole time. I mean, the whole tournament was calm, cool, and collected. Like, I don't know how else to describe it. I think I can help out. Um, my two wheelhouses, like volleyball's our wheelhouse, right? I, you know, yeah. uh, we, I think we have a combined um, 80 years experience. Um <laughs> She's like, no, you, I'm still young, dude. Um, <laughs> dude, I could read the Bible and reminisce. I'm an old dude. Um, <laughs> so I'm also a theater guy too, right? Some of the best performers will tell you the minute you're out there on stage trying to be good, you won't be good because it's too yeah. much pressure. And you're thinking, and your mind's completely somewhere else instead of the work. Uh, uh, and some of the people who make it about their scene partner um, and have this give and take where that allows them to come back into the scene and that allows them to do like a, a 50 shows over and over the same way again, you know, not the exact same way, right? We're not machines, we're people, but like the same wavelength right. um, yeah. has given them their success. And how much do you agree in that sense in, in terms of volleyball? Because there are levels to this. You're an AVP champ, so I'm going to, I'm punting this to you. I, yeah, I think, I think just focusing on, mm -hmm we're literally just going to play volleyball. We know how to play volleyball. Both Carly and mm. I, we played all season, right? Like we played with different partners, but we still played all season. We had pretty good seasons, both mm. of us. So it was a matter of just like, okay, like let's go out and literally just pass the ball, set the ball, hit the ball. Mm -hmm. Like that, it was just like over and over again, balls down. It was like, okay, next. Like it was, there was no stress. It was just, we were focused on next play right. every single time and it was like almost just an unsaid thing like we didn't there was literally no stress between if we were losing at one point if we mm. lost a point there was no conversations of like hey let's get it together it was just kind of like okay next like let's go pass the ball now mm -hmm. yeah um do you coach juniors at all have you done clinics with juniors i used to coach yeah. a lot um i haven't coached since 2019. all right cool now for me I think there's a certain age with players that 
uh, um, as far as the neck up is concerned, the muscles between your ears as opposed to the physical. Um, I, I have this philosophy called big waves crash, right? Every every five points you get emotionally high, you're probably going to give up nine on the low, right? Uh, and, I'm, yeah. and I'm exaggerating those numbers to to prove a point. It's more like it's more like six eight, not not five nine. Right. Um, big waves crash. Small waves get you from pier to pier. You know, from Manhattan Pier to to Hermosa Pier, where I live. Um, and is I guess my question is is that is that synonymous to, to the advantage you had coming in? You guys were, I wouldn't use the word cold. I'm, I'm trying to, um, and I want you to work with me on my description here. You weren't yeah. cold. I just think you guys were high when you needed to be. It was like, yes, you get, you would get a stuff block. Yes, pump your fist, reset, yeah. rinse, repeat, right? Catch that yeah. fish. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I mean, it was like after mm. the play was over, mm. yeah, you're, you know, cheering, excited energy. Mm-hmm. But it wasn't like if we lost the point, it was like, that's okay. Like next, you yeah. know, you're not, there was just an understanding of like, we're not going to win every point. Uh, yeah. And I think very few of those, right? <laughs> right. Like you're not going to win every point. You're going to lose some points. So if something happened, it was like, oh, well, mm. and I think, I think it just goes back to the, we didn't have any pressure from ourselves, from anyone, you know, like we, there was no expectation. So being able to just go and like, yay we're playing volleyball like even if, it, even if something weird happened it was mm. like oops next <laughs> you know like nice it just there was never i guess those low moments because you're so you know worried about winning or you're so stressed out like that you have to perform at a certain level it just was like no expectations and i'm like over here okay how can i bring this into every single tournament that i go to now nice yeah. To guys told you she was good <laughs> i just asked her the same question three different ways and she touch and she rode the journey see what i mean about the cliff the steering wheel jesus take the wheel um all right so let's get a little bit to the physical part and possibly mental part uh, uh, of my next question because again this is a conversation this ain't you know you you're not here by the power of subpoena this ain't an interview or an interrogation right. um oh give me something let's make it about your partner a little bit give me something that if you had to pick one thing or maybe two if, uh, things that you thought she did well the entire tournament that that helped make this this comfortable playing atmosphere for, for you um i usually like one thing but sometimes people can't help themselves i'm like they're like coach you gotta give me you gotta let me give you two <laughs> so if yeah. there's one thing that you thought she did well that helped you guys um enjoy this level of success that you're by the way looking back at retrospectively not in that moment right <laughs> am i right, right about that like yeah. or at that moment you're in the moment you're not thinking about how cool that is you know or, yeah. or maybe you are I'm, i know ken was but um yeah. yeah so if there's one thing you thought she did let's say physically and let's just say so if it's not physical if it's like if something psychological comes in your mind first um the floor is yours okay Physically, I mean, I love that you said both because I have one for each. Okay. Physically, she is just an exceptional player. Like she is an athlete, right? She jumps high. She's fast. She's technically sound. She's just like a quiet player. I think she's so underrated. Like she's just so good. She's so wow, good. Just... <laughs> I'm not, and I'm I literally mean... like, wait, are, is everyone else seeing this? Like it's no, crazy. They weren't. No, no. they're seeing it now they i'll tell you that now, but i i remember playing her like i played her so many times this season and you know she's good but then playing with her was a whole different perspective like i was on the same side of the net and i was just like holy sh like what is going on like i would set her the ball and she would just jump and i was like okay cool that's a point <laughs> like it was insane and just yeah i mean she balled out she's just a very very good player yeah. um that's my physical i don't even know. i mean she's just an athlete and she is technically sound she knows she has so many so many shots too like it's not like she's just like hitting or high line it's like she has she has everything um yeah she's incredible mentally it was just the fact that she was able to stay level-headed with me and I'm like the player that I am never serious because I don't play well that way. Like I'm the one that's constantly cracking jokes. People always yep. make fun of me too because I'll like compliment the other team, right? Like you got to laugh 
Mm-hmm. Otherwise it's too serious. And like, <laughs> I'll like compliment the other team. And I'm just like over here, honestly, just grateful to be there. Right. Like that's my mindset. And she's just very, she was very level-headed with me. Like it was easy to just be relaxed the whole time. Like I said, there was no stress, um, at least on my end. And like, you know, seeing from the outside looking in, it didn't look like she was ever stressed. So yeah. that was really easy. It just made it, it just made it easy. All right. So from a physical standpoint, I like, cause you know, I've, I've been coaching like half my life. I look at some plays where you like set her and I'm like, dude, if she can turn on this one. If she sees this, that would be awesome. Oh, she just, she did. Wow. Uh, you know, Gino in the four block moves in the cut, changes it to a five. I'm like, man, if she sees that and goes, I'm thinking like at, at, at a one second pace, if she if she goes line over here, she, she, she that means she's a, she's a savage. She sees it. Oh, cool. She went line over. And uh, yeah. like every play that I thought she should have did before she swung, she did. So what you were saying about this girl, like, has not not has anyone not noticed <laughs> this well, this absolute I mean, savage <laughs> yes she she literally does everything but that was also something that uh you know obviously in beach volleyball communication is huge you know especially you know you get set and you're waiting for the call that was something that we did really well which i think would surprise a lot of people based on our lack of practice together and just like playing together but there was, at least on my end, um, there was a level of trust that like, I was like, okay, she's calling it, like I'm hitting it, right? And I think, I mean, all weekend, there was like the communication of just making the right call. It just was easy, which I, I think again comes from the no stress. Because if you're so worried about making the right call or you don't want to mess up for your partner, just like something like that where you have those expectations, I think you can that's when you start to make those little errors where you're like making the wrong calls or you don't know what to say. And it was just like it, playing with her was so easy. Yeah. Can you appreciate it? How um, like me, you and I are just agreeing how bizarre the connection was, because this is one of the things that we're told um, takes years as, as far as getting to know your partner. Right. Like for the people um, not watching vol- that don't watch a lot of volleyball, because this podcast is turning into more than that. Um, like someone giving someone a call and maybe having like a, a, a whole second or three quarters of a second to process the call and execute, um, a lot of people believe takes time, right? Uh, I'm, there are some 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 players. I'm like, you just call that. You just made that call in mid swing. He, he ain't get. He, he's in the middle of his swing and you're saying line. He ain't. Come on, man. He ain't get that call. You're, yeah. not, even, you're not even helping that dude. You know. Yeah. <laughs> so <Yeah>. right. <laughs> what is he supposed to do? Uh, you're like this line. <laughs> You know, he's in the middle of his way. No, so there's something to be said about um, communicating with each other, having, um, knowing your partner well enough to know her estimated time of processing that call uh, and execution that that goes, you know, with the physical. So that's why I was asking. And I'm glad you gave me answers for both. You gave me answers for both. That was was pretty cool. Yeah. Those were, and those just came right to my mind. I was like, I remember Mark after we won, like asked me and I was like, she just jumped so high. I felt like I could set her anywhere and she was going to go do Carly things. And I was just like, okay. And that's what we should call it from now on. Carly things. You know why? Because she's been there the, um, I think for this year, if I only had to use this year as a sample size, she's been there the whole time. Yeah. She's been there the whole time. That's the craziest part. She has, she had such a good year and was like, at om- I think all of the main draws, almost all the tournaments, like finished top three. And I'm mm. just like, <laughs> yeah, I don't get it. I don't get it. It's like me being a, a, a like a boss in my own business and I come in and I, and I see a person next to the receptionist and I'm like, was she that whole time? Was she late? <laughs> Did she sneak in? They're like, no, yes. no, she was actually here the whole time. <laughs> She's been here for two years working for you, sir. <laughs> yeah. Let's yeah. find out what she does. Let's find out what she does. Oh my God, what she does that? 
come on yeah now. come on yeah <laughs> i i also like that you described your personality as someone that keeps the mood light that allows you to function right because you know yeah. not not all players are built the same there are some players that feel like they got to be angry all the time and then then there's that gray in between the middle that mixture of intensity and keeping the mood light and there's yeah. some people who freaking play so much so just so, play too much so there's there's levels that give people success but i like what you said because i think there's more longevity there's more volleyball longevity psychologically if you yeah. don't burn yourself out stressing over over um things that are not that big absolutely i uh I mean, I was like a crazy psycho volleyball person before. You, well, you played sure indoor, went. so of course you did. <laughs> yeah, and it was my whole life. It's all I wanted to do. I think there was just, you know, obviously, I'm sure Wendy told you that I, I got super sick, you know, stuff like that. And it just, it sounds so cheesy, but it really does change your perspective on everything that you do from that point forward. And... You know, I literally, I don't even know how to describe myself. The person I was before I was sick, I was crazy about volleyball. It's all I wanted to do. It's all I thought I could do. It was my whole identity, right? So so now playing volleyball, it's like, I get to be here. Someone said something to me that was so profound. They were like, because when I first started playing AVP and we qualified, no, in my mind, I was like, this isn't happening. Like, I... I, this is my first year. This is my first tournament. Like <laughs> this isn't happening. And it happened. And I was like, oh my gosh, I should not be here. What am I doing here? And my friend was like, hey, you know, I think the biggest thing for you is to like, be grateful that you're here because fear and gratitude cannot exist in the same space. And I was like, you are correct. Yeah. So, I mean, that was like the big shift for me was just like, hey, I get to play volleyball. You know, I, I get to do it for fun. It's not a stressful thing for me anymore. Um, I'm healthy. I have a body that moves. So like, let's just, that's what we're doing now. Yeah. And I think that perspective shift has helped me become a better player and be even be able to play beach volleyball because obviously Montana, it's not a thing here. Yeah, kid from Brooklyn. I got gotcha. you. Yeah. So <laughs> I got gotcha you covered. Being, being grateful and like having that perspective is... Yeah. A life changer. It's strange that you said that gratitude and fear can't exist in the same space, but don't you find it ironic that they're they're still joined together? Ooh, can you explain that a little a little deeper? Like what you mean by that? I'll give you an example. Um, someone pays me money to sweep a street, right? I'm proud of the work I do, um, so I'm sweeping the street, and the street is spotless, it's almost spotless to a point where everybody's like, "That's what that guy's good at." and nothing else yeah you're grateful yeah. right you're, you're you're grateful that they appreciate and the appreciation and grateful I'm, I'm trying to tread the fine line because those are different meanings too so bear with me um yeah. grateful that they they acknowledge your work or appreciate they acknowledge your work but you're you're not just that you're more than that and your fear is that's all you're going to be known for right mm. and you want more and everybody's like you should just be grateful you have this a lot of people don't have that and and and, and in your mind that's bullshit <laughs> you know so i think they are on opposite sides of the fence but and and i do agree that they they can't exist in the same space but but, they do I, but ironically but ironically they're they they're they're joined together G.I. Joe and, and Cobra, <laughs> right? Uh, yeah. um, tra uh, Autobots and Decepticons. They, they don't exist in the same space, but. But they're constantly battling for sure. Yeah. I don't, I think about, I think about um, going back to indoor. And Please. yes, I was grateful that I was, I was able to play volleyball. However, I was scared that that's all I was good at and that's all I could do. And I wasn't ever going to reach my full potential. But then I think if you think about it more, was I, I guess my level of like gratitude was different. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, I was grateful to play volleyball, but again, there's the fear of like, is this my life? Is this all I have? Is this all I'm good at? Cause what am I going to do after volleyball? I think what kind of saved your your soul there was the early um, examination of that. Like cer certain people, they're so into it 
it's years and years when they realize, and I hate saying this to volleyball players, and I'm so glad I don't need to say it to you because you, you already got it figured out. Um, and I'll say this to the camera, and I said this to Savvy Simo too, and she, she, I don't know, she was heartbroken by it or whatever. I said, the job can't save your ass. Yeah. The job can't save your ass. Um, you ever see The Wire, the HBO drama, The Wire? I don't think so. There was a guy named Officer McNulty, Dominic West, um, this Brit who put on a Baltimore accent, and he's Baltimore police, um, cheats on his wife, Al alcoholic, uh, betrays his superiors every chance he gets, goes over their head. But the one thing he's good at, he's really good police. You give him a case, he's going to solve it. He's a savage, and there's there's no escape in this man's this this high IQ um, a level in which he approaches something he does best. That mm. case gets down, it's on to the next one. It's on to the next one. It's on to the next one. He just keeps going. This and it's this this revolving. Uh, I would call it uh, absurdist approach. The theater of the absurd meaning circular action where you're right back where you started from at the, Patterns, at the, at yeah. the end of each act, except it's a slightly worsening condition. So at the end, the last season, his partner told him, look, when this is over, at some point this is going to be over. You can't do this the rest of your life. And what's there at the end? He says, um, family with different last names. You know, like we and volleyball players, I think you know that family with different last yeah. names, right? Like close friends where you're your brothers and sisters. Um, other things other than this, because this you think you think can save you because it has this great feeling and it for it gives you financial support. Right. So you're like, wow, this sport saved my life, you know, and and and, it, and at that time it did. Right. And I'm talking yeah. about you, and I'm talking a little bit about me, but I don't mean to make this about me because I play overseas too. Um, but it's providing financial support. It provides you this level of escapism, right, from right. from your normal life. And, that, and then, you, then, but then, when your escapism becomes your career, you need to have something else, or it's going to burn you out, or you're going to think it's going to save you every time. Right. It's yeah, for sure. It's the pattern of trying to escape from having to, you know, from reality right that is so crazy you said that i but i mean you, fi I just you figured it that. i don't mean to interrupt but you figured it out and i'm gonna give you the floor back and that's all i wanted to say you were the one you were lucky enough to figure that out early well i didn't i mean it definitely wasn't on my own like i i think about if i was never diagnosed with cancer i would probably still be this person that's like what am i doing with my life like who am i supposed to be I'm just going to go overseas and play volleyball one more season because I have no idea what else I'm good at. And I'm too scared to put myself out there in anything because I'm too old. Like it was that whole process. Like that was my thought process. And I had to stop playing volleyball. And then at, at a point I was like, okay, all your, your only job is to survive. Like that's all you're doing. You don't have to worry about anything. Just go and like make it through this. And that what I mean, that was like the catalyst to me becoming this person and having this perspective. And I'm like, so grateful for it going back to grateful, you know, gratitude and fear. It's like, I'm so grateful for that experience. And it's funny, because then you're like, well, I was scared to die. But I'm also grateful to be here. <laughs> it's like funny. But it's yeah, it's, I it's every bit. It's everyone. And deep it's down, everyone. There's deep down. yeah, there's the what side are you going to focus on, I guess, is mm. is the big question for people. But yeah, I, that was the huge change that happened in my life that I now am able to like be this person. And it is what got me to figure it out because other, without it, yeah. yeah, I guess if you don't, if you're not forced to change, are you going to change? Right. Validation and product and being self uh, or being productive not self-productive that's whatever whatever you want to call that it <laughs> is almost in the same category as fear and gratitude right i mean yeah being productive and and doing things that you think that are worthwhile to your life or affect the lives of other people um you, we're not machines we're people their, their validation is gonna is gonna is gonna seep in and valid and and validation meaning being recognized for your work um through whatever be it through meritocracy or be it through being in the right place at the right time being with the good old boys club or being some homeless guy who made it to being a millionaire right validation is always yeah. going to find its way and the fear i believe is if someone doesn't recognize you 
for all the work you put in and the sacrifice you made. You tend to say, hey, you know, screw you. I did this, I did that, I did this, and I did that. And the next thing you know, you become what you despise. You know, you're like, because you never say, I want to be that person that has to keep saying, oh, I did this and I did that or whatever. Big, and this is, and you, you're recognizing, you don't need to be a shrink to recognize this is a self-diagnosis too. This is, um, <laughs> where I'm not saying we're in the same boat, but I, 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 yeah. I I'm not, I'm, I'm not a doctor, but I recognize the symptoms. And I'm, I think you might go, you might have gone through a little bit of that. And it was yeah. ovarian, ovarian cancer, right? Yes. Right. Okay. Well, man. So, geez, sorry. I was going to talk about, I didn't mean to put no downer on this, but this, this is, a, no, this is, a, this is a serious conversation. Someone out here is going to be like, they're right. And I need to, you know, maybe we can get, maybe with this conversation, get some people to do that, to just self-examine early. They won't. They won't yeah. get sick. Uh, we call we call it modern prevention. <laughs> uh, yeah, I I heard something about a guy who was like, you either the only way people change is like a, an extreme low or an extreme high. Yeah, and like unfortunately, I think yeah, that does have to happen for people to be able to self examine mm -hmm. in every sense of the word. Like you know, we were talking about the guy. The job isn't going to save you. People go. And, you know, do these jobs or play volleyball to avoid other things. And until you, until you self-examine, that's going to be the pattern that you go through over and over and over again. Circular action. I, I'm yeah. a big theater guy, so I don't know what people, if people knew what I meant by theater of the absurd. Theater of the absurd is a style of theater um, that has circular action where I just explained to you where um, anyone's ever seen Waiting for Godot or, or you know, or rhinoceros or any Beckett play knows that at the end of each act, there is this journey. And then at the end of the journey, you, you're almost or exactly where, where you started, except for one thing. It's a little slightly worse. The next scene, right back where you started from. And, then, and then this deteriorating condition, it's called theater of the absurd. Um, and, and it's my, oddly enough, it's my favorite kind of theater. <laughs> 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 when I, I'm a, as a theater performer, one of my be my favorite plays was um um a written written by Susan Laurie Parks and and she's one of the best absurdist playwrights um out there. People you know call her style Brechtian, blah blah blah. But that's a whole other um universe in which I didn't mean for us to talk about. But I can't help it because there's so many similarities with theater performance, like your approach to theater and and, and your approach to volleyball. Like like we just said, if you make it about your partner. You're not thinking about the score. Next thing you know, you won 21 12. If yeah. you're out there and the crowd's watching you and you're like, I'm going I'm to show this crowd what I'm made of, I'm going to set the world on fire, that might not work for you. Yeah. Everyone's different. Yeah. I, think it, I think it does work for some people. Some, some people thrive off of like being involved with the crowd. Some mm -hmm. people thrive off of like playing angry or, you know, being a big shit talker, or whatever. Some people thrive off of making jokes and yeah. complimenting the other team. Yeah. And that's what makes us <laughs> human beings because anyone yeah. that wants to mimic the approach of being highly intense or being that that this person who's I guess whose um DNA allows them to do it and, and sustain that, that might not be the other person's way to follow. They might yeah. you, they can only last so long doing that. And you're just this yeah. miserable person. You know, it's it's crazy. So yeah, yeah, so so ask so I wanted to to ask one more question of before we get into this this fun universe we tipped we dipped our, our toe in. Um one more question about um the finals, the AVP, okay? You talked about we talked about um Carly, fantastic performer, and we're gonna mention her again before this is over because there's right. we you know, right now, all right, trying to I'm not trying to brag, but I'm the most viewed po volleyball podcast in the sport right now. Period. 15,000. My average is 15,000 views an episode. And, and, and that's for volleyball. I'd like to think that's pretty good. That is well, it's, really it's good. It's more than second, third and fourth put together. So, yeah. so, and I might delete that part because they're like, here he goes again, but no, no, brag. But, no, but if they're listening and we keep talking about Carly, that's a win for Carly. She deserves it. That's the point. That, that was the point I was trying it. to make. She deserves, I, I, and my wife was like, you know, this girl, right? And I said, I've seen her at beach volleyball national events. Because she's young enough, and BVNE run by Deron Forbes, I was a color commentator for the semis and finals, and I was also her volleyball skills coach for Endless Summer all the way up to 2019, like you, you know. And that group of girls graduating 
around the time that they're just after her and around that time is this group of savages that told the generation before them your time's up <laughs> wow. i mean you you get you you get in shape or your time's up Yurango, <laughs> she's still there because she keeps all her promises physically and nutrition wise yes right? think about think about the girls who are still around uh, kalinsky hughes uh, um right um Chang, these are girls who are not just talented. They 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 keep their promises. Or this new group of girls are going to are going to push you off the cliff. They're gonna yeah. oh, they're going to o yeller you. Okay, well, they're gonna take you out in the yard sport. and pull the trigger. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I think there's just so much there's so much more opportunity for mm -hmm. young girls to play beach volleyball. Mm -hmm. Like I literally started playing in 20, 2021. Like as a serious player, I played for funsies in twenty twenty. Like local tournaments in austin texas but like yep. <clears throat> i was never exposed to it before that except for one year in college but now it's like a college sport people literally yeah. get recruited to go play beach volleyball so then they come out of college and they're like mm -hmm. okay either there you're gonna like you said stay in shape and keep playing or you're gonna be pushed off the cliff four years of a free gym membership right four years of sports psychologists right uh free sports psychology four years of of savage coaching because these some of these guys who are glorified babysitters want to you know who want who some are some love love the coach and some are just some just want to get in front of that parade but but they're also good coaches four years of that and they're coming out of college of course right yeah this year Every single tournament had someone that was one move year, or year, uh, one one year removed from graduation, uh, yeah. in the semis or the finals. Haley yeah. Harward, Tina Gradina, who's um, her godfather is my mentor, uh, taught me. Julia Scholes. Yeah, Scholes. Yeah, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Scholes. Dan, <laughs> Dan, Dan. Yeah. That's how I call her now on from now on, right? Um, yes. Yeah, not to mention all the people from LMU who graduated. You know, mm -hmm. Rice or whatever. I was John Mayer's assistant for two years. So, so um, Todd is Chrissy Jones. You know, Todd would play for Todd Rogers for one year. Yep. Cal Poly is cool. You're more than familiar with. So, mm -hmm. um, and we'll, man, okay, we're definitely going to talk about that too. So my <laughs> question before I drive us both off the cliff, getting back for, for, for the AVP fans listening, who, who all, all the fans in whom you allowed to follow their journey, um, give me one or two things you'd like to do better in the year 2022. And if you'd like to choose a physical fundamental, and if you'd like to choose a psychological approach, the same way you do with Carly, and uh, um, I'd like you to do that for yourself. Um, things you want to do better. For her, it was things you thought she did well. For you, it's thing one or two things you want to do better. Physically, I want to be, everyone says they want to be the best blocker, right? I want to be a better blocker than I was in 2022. Okay. Like I, I want to, you know, everything that comes with it. I want to block more balls. I, my eye work, I want it to be impeccable. I want to be able to read people like a freaking book. Like right. there's, you're not going to do a cut shot on me because I'm going to see you do it and I'm going to block it, yeah. you know, like that's what I want to do. Um, so picking a subset of blocking like you just did, um, um, maybe um so maybe repeat that maybe repeat that one thing you said about blocking I'm, I'm i want you to i want us to be specific blocking is general believe it or not let's be specific here's my yes. i'm challenging you now let's do it definitely definitely general so just i work mm -hmm. if i'm gonna and i mean as far as like i see someone knuckle i'm gonna pull off the net and dig it you know i like such a good read that i can literally see someone go high line and i'm just like running back there to go get it you know like my partner doesn't have to do anything i'm just gonna read all the balls which sounds so unreasonable but that's like i mean it's the psycho level that got me to where i was in indoor yeah have you noticed the best blockers on the outdoor scene are indoor players i mean look you got phil who's who's the rare exception um but read pretty right he had to split block he was awesome <laughs> um um who else came Shaw had to split block with Reed pretty so i remember the first tournament they played together that was a qualifier match against rafa rodriguez and kevin kevin mccullock like the best qualifier match ever <laughs> and at hunting at the pier in huntington right right in front of the pier that's, cool. yeah. that's on youtube people um no but i like that so for me because i'm six one and but i was always i was a proud blocker um i learned in germany uh, i had a really good coach out there 
he always said ball hitter ball. So one, mm. find out where the ball is being set. Two, identify the hitter. And once you see the hitter, you are then then it's just ball again because everything in your peripherals um, allows you to pursue to go ball first and less about hitter body language, right? Because sometimes hitter body language says something completely different too, right? Right? Yeah, they're opening up. You know, you think they're going to do this and they do that. So I think that's right. what, yeah. Do you, so as a blocker, educate the people. Cause again, this is your wheelhouse, not mine. You're the champion here, not me. Um, <laughs> is it, is it more about waiting, waiting late or, or, or just, um, is it, I work as does I work and just waiting, uh, um, as far as level of importance, what, what's. Uh, walk walk me through a little bit of that if you get my question. Am I even ask? Am I even asking a question? <laughs> yeah, no, I understand the question. I'm just my imposter syndrome is kicking in of like you don't really know what you're talking about because you haven't been playing beach long enough. Um, based on my ex my personal experience so far in the sport, mm -hmm. for me, I think it's it's the eye work because you don't know if you should wait or not unless you're making a good read on the hitter right because if the hitter is coming in to swing and you're just waiting right and then they blast the ball by you right oh, they like, pull their trigger happen. first yeah right but and that's an like, indoor oh. thing too right so i'm look i'm not a beach guy but i i mean i, I know my indoor so that's an indoor thing too <laughs> but not i don't think as much because in indoor it's like you are hitting the ball hard almost every time like sometimes yeah. you're tipping but it's a lot easier to read right like indoor is like you're gonna go hit the ball whereas beach it's like people are shooting a lot there it is and so for me uh, something i do is i do wait yeah but i try i'm trying to make a good read i'm like okay are they coming into swing or are they going high line which most of the time i feel against like a big blocker they're mm -hmm. gonna try and shoot around you so i'm trying to wait to go touch that ball that's being shot right but unless you have good eye work, it's like a guess. Yeah. Right. Like you're just guessing the whole time. Well, that's this is this question isn't a false dichotomy. I was just talking about levels of importance. It's I wasn't <laughs> saying it's either eye work or weight, right? That's that's right, right. That's, no, us, I us narrowing this argument down to two choices. I think the the losers are the people listening to this podcast. <laughs> no, <laughs> right? I am I right? <laughs> I work is a mo I yeah. think more important. Yeah, good. I like that. And and I love our differing philosophies on that, right? But again, I'm not playing on the beach. You brought up to me the operative words you use were shooting. It, they they shoot, you know, right? Yeah. So you're not just reading for indoor power. I mean, okay, someone's gonna knuckle over over on an indoor game sixes game, right? With three defenders back there. Good luck with that, right? So I I totally <laughs> right, but but right. So so I. I yeah. have my reasons why I think that way, and you, and and clearly for the audience listening, you're showing me my, why my reasons reasoning is flawed on that, you know. But I was also I was also spoiled with coaching good beach blockers too. Like Jeff's a great blocker for his size, you know. Yeah. I coached Earl Schultz, you know, the the guy with the Lenny Kravitz afro. Coached him in a main draw. He's he's got yeah. hang he's got hang time, you know. So yeah, yeah. But I always say wait because. If it's a sh if they try to pull their trigger first, you don't need to stuff someone straight down on the beach because not five people they're right. covering, you know. So so you don't need the 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 classic indoor one where there's no, there's nowhere to cover but straight but under the net or straight down, right? Right. So yeah. so there's there's a philosophy behind mine too. But I'm learning from you right now. I'm learning from you in this conversation, and I'm learning from you. Yeah. Like I'm still I, there's just mm. so much for me to learn still that I'm yeah. like. What is more important to you right now in this yeah. moment? I work is more important to you right now. You answered your own question. It is. And you know, the cool <laughs> thing is this, like you answer the question for a lot of people who want to be good blockers too, right? Um, I have this luxury of watching. I don't have a nine to five. All I do is I coach and I do commentary. And when I'm, and when I'm not doing that, I'm watching videos <laughs> all the, like a savage. Dang. And if I, if, and if I fall asleep and if I think someone knows more about the sport than me, I wake up. And I, and I turn on my YouTube thing and I watch more videos. So, but I am not a fool. I know there's nothing like in the world, like being on the court and playing it. And, and the, the gladiators in the arena speech, I have a love hate relationship with that speech.
you know, because they're, they're, they're a bunch of Monday morning quarterbacks. They're like, you should find something else to do. And I'm like, wow, says some, says the person who's, who you know, who doesn't know the difference between a Mizuno and a Tachikara, <laughs> right? What's the difference? You don't know. <laughs> One's a shoe. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> You're like, One's wait, I just... <laughs> One's, one's a ball. <laughs> one's a ball. One's a yeah. A, a juniors club and a sh and a, and a goddamn shoe. <laughs> yeah. Spandex shirts, they got it all. <laughs> so I like the eye work. I like blocking. Uh, um, now self exam. Let's 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 get into this brain more. Let's talk about the psychological. It's not fair, right? Me asking these questions. Not fair. Come on, let's go. I, uh, I just have always, I don't want to say struggle because I think it has made me, you know, the player that I became an indoor and that I am becoming the beach. Um, I, my level of confidence could use some work. Like I'm, I'm constantly like people are, wow, you did so good. Like you hit every ball and you didn't get blocked one time, whatever people are going to say to me. <laughs> and you're like, hey, I'm shut over up. here. <laughs> Yeah, I'm like, I'm over here like, uh, I could do that better, you know? And it's like this constant game of like, ooh, that's maybe not enough, um, which gets into more, you know, trauma, <laughs> whatever, <laughs> whatever. But like, I just feel like I'm constantly, I'm never okay with how I did. Right. Okay. It's not bad, but honest, like, honest to God, my brain is like, hmm, you could have done better. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sure. You scored on that ball, but like you also missed that one. Right. You that know? just comes. I, with, no, this is please talk. I talked enough, please. <laughs> no, I was just it's just the same of I just I've always wanted to be better. Right. So you don't your one of your weaknesses and are not a weakness, but somewhere where you think you'd like to show self-improvement is um, taking a moment to realize. Yes. That, that was that was a great moment. This is a good tournament. And at the same time, um, not be complacent in your success. Yes. How's that sound? Yes, that sounds perfect. You just said perfect. I also uh, I also want to have. I mean, <clears throat> like I said, when I in twenty twenty one, my first season playing, I'm like, wow, you should not be here. <laughs> yeah. This is your first year playing beach volleyball. You don't really know what you're doing, and I want to switch that to like, oh, please serve me. I want to yeah. hit the ball. What and position did you play indoor? Pardon? What position did you play indoor? I played middle blocker and I also played um thankless freaking job. But go ahead. <laughs> now I was like I thankless the... freaking job. <laughs> yeah. I played well, I played all I played six rotations. So I played six in the back row, hit the bick. Everyone should do that. <laughs> middle so blockers. Fun. Middle blockers. Get rid of that libero. Get rid of that person everybody feels sorry for because she's short. No, we got big girls that can receive serve too. <laughs> yeah, I played six rotations. It was so much fun. <laughs> it was so fun. And my mentality, I, like I'm in the back row and I literally was like, hey, uh, I don't care. Set me the ball. <laughs> yeah. Let me like every time I was like, no, set me. It's okay. Anyone my age right now is standing up and applauding you for saying that because the libero position was not introduced until 2001. All right. So if you look at all of the great players back then, like Steve Timmons, before he was an oppo, he was a middle receiving serve. Craig mm. Buck was forced by his coach to play single A ball until he could receive serve the six, seven middle Olympic gold medalist. Right. Um, maybe I'll go. Dane, the Dane Blanton route, like Greg, Greg Shankel, who was the middle. They won a chip in 92 uh, against Canyon Seaman. It was like a, a rock star game between Pepperdine and Stanford. All of those middles could receive serve. Tom Sorensen, you know? Uh, um, I love that you're saying all these names, and I'm like. Yep. I know. Yeah. No, I'm doing that for them. <laughs> I'm doing that for them. No, because. No, you, I'm, I'm here for it. I'm just no. like. Yep. But think about this, all right? There 
the libero position, we understand the importance in regards to serve, receive, and defense or whatever. And me as a coach, I'm always looking for a libero to be the best defender because serve, receive, I already got the talent at, at the oppo and, out, and outside. I could have a libero on the court that doesn't even receive, sir. I don't care. I just want that guy to be able right. to dig five or six. But at the same time, right, that's the middle you could be using for the big, some a gargantuan. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That could yeah. be shaking heaven and earth, throwing down, <laughs> right? Throwing down the big like they owe you money. <laughs> Yes, that was my favorite attack. Yeah. I mean, when they put me in the back row to hit that, I was like, this is so fun. You yeah. can just fly. It's a high set. Doesn't yep. matter like where it is, right? You, mm. They set a high, you just go get it. Run the, well, one of my favorite plays before the bit came, because there was always a back row. I used to like to run a 31 front two, the 31 mm -hmm. and the outside yes. hit on the front two, because, and this is, now, now we're in my territory now, or our territory. Before it was your territory, right? <laughs> and I'm just talking, right? But now it's our territory. Um, yeah. Like, if some coaching systems have the middle, follow the middle, right? Then that's mm -hmm. where 32, front run 32 is open. Uh, right. All the cross court in the world, a lot, a lot of real yeah. estate you could hit, right? But then when you have someone running kind of a back row quick, you know, that's got size, like you, you're a middle, right? It's a de facto two. It's a de facto 31 front yep. two. Or the girls, sorry, the girls call it a B set and some of the girls call it a, a three. But on the East Coast, all the, this immigrant population, we all agree to just call it 31. Uh -uh. Yeah. Right? The Russians, the Dominicans, you know, all the guys in New York that are just, that have been playing since their childhood who are all playing together right now. Um, yeah. Shout out. Peace out, New York. Um, but yeah, good for you, man. And I, I think more middle should do it. You for know? sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think there's the stigma around like, oh, tall girls can't pass. And I'm like, y'all yeah. just need to give us a chance because we got the length mm -hmm. on defense. I would dig balls and I was like, oh, I can't believe my arm just got that ball. But it's like, mm -hmm. we're so long. I do it on the beach too. Like I'll dig a ball and I'm like, I had no, you know, how did I get that ball? Length. Yeah. Yep. So, yeah. So I think the piece of advice I can give you um, which is also within my wheelhouse, psychological, not physical play. As far as enjoying moments, take the moments you enjoy and put them in the same category as moments where you might be disappointed in a loss or whatever. Um, the one thing they have in common is they're very, very temporary. Right. <laughs> it's very, very temporary. So you, if, already, you, if you already have the gift of hitting the reset button on disappointments, um it'll be it's so much less it's less challenging than you think to take these moments and reflect and be like man i did that that was wild that was rad you know and you know when you can do that you could do that on my podcast <laughs> you have my permission and 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 we love you hey J jen we love you we love oh. you are loved you wore oh. your heart on your sleeve and you you allowed so many fans from the beginning of the uh, the, uh, the whatever that uh, people that showed up personally and, and and the world watching, you allowed so many fans to take the journey with you. So if you lost, they probably would have cried for you with you in in a metaphoric sense, right, or a physical sense. Uh, you won; they're happy for you. You yeah. ever been in the situation where someone says, "This is the best thing that ever happened to me," and it didn't even happen to me? <laughs> That's how yeah. a lot of people felt when you won. There, there's someone out there that said this is the best thing that ever happened to me and it didn't even happen to me that's that's the feeling and and i i dare anyone and that includes you to take that moment and make it less than what it is it's beautiful it's golden we love you oh that okay. makes my heart smile yeah we love you celebrating I, other people is huge yeah i'd love to say i love you but i got a wife and i'm gonna get she she pretends she ain't jealous but i'm gonna get drop kicked do you know what a <laughs> drop do you know wife. what a drop kick looks like <laughs> you're around right. in the corner and then boom <laughs> <laughs> i'm kidding she's she's um anyone that's met her she's she's um she's an alpha and she's awesome outside hitter played at west uh, um parkersburg west virginia went to harvard you know won two state championships Ooh. at um her high school so she's a she knows she she loves volleyball and, and she, when we moved here zero indoor we, we lived near the pier and i'm like when was the last time you played indoor and she was like six years ago <laughs> yeah i haven't played indoor i haven't played mm -hmm. indoor since yeah 2019. what got you into um volleyball i mean the real deal childhood jennifer dude i got 
this question is threefold. I'm trying to, I'm keeping the childhood. We're going to start child. I'm trying to arrange some chronology on this erratic podcast. Well, <clears throat> hilarious. Uh, it's not hilarious. It's a funny story. But I played soccer growing up my whole life. All of a sudden, I shoot up to what? I don't know. I was tall. And, um, you know, going into high school, my parents were like, hey, uh, we know you like soccer, but it's the same season as volleyball. And we think that you should choose a sport where your height benefits you. Basically telling me, like, you're done playing soccer and you're going to play volleyball. Right. And I was like, how dare you? And so orientation of high school, I go and I go and sign up for cheerleading. And I said, I'm going to serve. I'm going to show my parents. <laughs> I'm going to show them what's what. I go and sign up for cheerleading. And the girls at the table are just looking up at me like, where are we going to put her? <laughs> and I'm like, hi. You know, like, no. just stupid. And of course, uh, I leave. They call me and I was like, yeah, I'm not going to do cheerleading. I'm sorry. I can't. And I, that's when I started only playing volleyball. I was 13 in high school, freshman year. Okay. Some Maybe of these, 12. some of these Jedi masters talking about too old. She's too old. <laughs> yeah. Too Look, putting you in yeah. cheerleading is like putting a lead lady in an ensemble cast and expecting her to hunch with all the short people you know like the, you're supposed to roll with the pack and you're this ridiculously tall girl that's supposed to hunch hell no don't hunch you stand tall shoulders chest out shoulders high like you're fighting crime <laughs> yeah i mean that's, that's right. I, volleyball has been such a gift for that because obviously yeah. i am tall and it's yes. just like being a young girl who's six one i'm 13 years old i'm taller than everyone and it was like uh no like we love how tall you are go hit the ball and that's been super empowering right wow we hadn't you know <laughs> it's so weird because when you're saying that i'm thinking of like hitman for hire award um <laughs> oh. on a previous episode we did an award show called um our award show it was me it was uh matt prosser um and aaron wexler ex-ucla guy um, oh love actually. him he is I mean, whenever I've, I'm, 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 I'm in my hater mode, I got to call him or Wendy Jones because they're always glass half full. I need, I yeah. need positive people in my life or I'll just be a miserable F. I swear, I, I crap you not. Um, but we had an award called Hitman for Hire Award. And this is before your tournament in Florida. And I, I swear to God, I would have changed my vote <laughs> if I knew, if I knew what you and her were going to do in Florida. <laughs> uh, and I don't even remember who it was. Like our newcomer here was Julia Scholes. Yeah. Right? And male was pretty academic. That was Taylor Sander. No first year player made an impact like him, you know? Yeah. Um, but Hitman for Hire award. The men was Andy Banesh. He was a hitman for hire. You need someone last minute. He's he's always the guy always picks up the phone and says yes, right? One Denver yeah. with Miles uh, Miles um, Evans, you know what I'm saying? Played international ball with, with the other Miles Miles Partain. Won uh, the second tournament with Phil. <laughs> this that is your consummate hitman for hire, and you're you're my new hitman for hire, right? You know, if you're in trouble, call Jen Ketty. Your cat's stuck in a tree, call Jen Ketty. Yeah. <laughs> we need to invade a country, strap a parachute on this woman's back. <laughs> Boom, we taking over in five minutes, Granada style. <laughs> yeah, we're doing it. <laughs> so that's what got you started. Yeah. All right. Here's, a question, here's a question I have um, that I, uh, I ask in most of my episodes, and, and in your case, it would be pod podcast malpractice if I didn't ask. Um, was there a particular tournament or a match where at the end of the match you left the match or tournament saying, um, this is, I think I could do this for real. I think I could do this for a living. This is who I am. This is what I do. This is how I roll. You know, I was just such a little idiot. And I say that in the nicest way possible to my younger self, but I even going into, I, I want to say my senior year. I mean, after uh, it was the final four of my junior year of high school, I was playing, you know, my parents believed in me before I believed in myself, right? So they're driving me three hours one way to volleyball practice to go to Spokane, Washington, so that I can wow. get scouted every weekend. They drove me to practice, bless their hearts. And I didn't even know what I was doing. Like I was just playing volleyball because I loved it. I didn't ever think that I was going to go to school for it or play yeah. college volleyball. 
And uh, after the final four that year is was the AVCA coaches convention or whatever it's called, where you go and you play and basically coaches can watch you after the final four. So I went and played at that. And that was when I started, you know, because being from Montana, you don't get a lot of exposure. And that moment I started getting so many letters from like organs, cows, University of Miami's, um, UCLA's, like all these big schools. And I'm just like, do 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 mom i got another letter like hand it to my mom didn't look at the letters like just They're like did you open it what did it say you're like no <laughs> i don't know <laughs> i literally gave it to my parents <clears throat> every every letter i got mm -hmm. and they ended up basically choosing my school and i there it is I mean, oh my god yeah. it's like an arranged wedding yes yeah. hey hey jane jen you're marrying Anthony. <laughs> no, it literally was how it went. And they they were like, okay, like, we really like Cal Poly. And I was like, okay. Smart you girl know. school. Yeah, it's a smart girl school. You know? I mean, and I'm always yeah. careful when I call a school a smart girl school, considering the academia in my family. But, you know, <laughs> good for you. Yeah. Glad you went, yeah. glad you went there. Me too. It was quite the experience. But um, I don't know, trying to remember in high school, the moment that I thought that I could do this for real. Mm -hmm. I don't, there's nothing that sticks out to me. I, I was so hard on myself. So hard on myself. I never thought that I was like good enough to play. Why? Uh, Why? You know, my freshman year, I went to, I won't say the school. I went to a school visit. They had already been recruiting me. And the coach tells me, he's like, yeah, just so you know, uh, you're probably not going to play because all the girls are really good. Um, so we, we'll probably redshirt you. Basically telling me like, hey, you can come here. You're not good enough. And then another school I went to, the coach is like complete opposite. He's like, you're going to be an All-American. And I was like, that sounds pretty good. Um, I don't know. Uh, I think that's a deep dive into childhood trauma, probably of me not thinking that I'm enough, you mm -hmm. know? Okay. If you want, if you want to go there, that's, <laughs> that's, that's deep where, stuff. I think if you want to, I think that might help some kids out there. Okay. Uh, I, and I've had a lot of self-evaluation just perspective wise, as we, you know, over the last few years of going through some serious stuff. Um, I think the not being good enough part comes from, you know, if you want to get into family stuff, generational trauma, I don't know if you believe in that or whatnot, but it's like, yeah, who, I you know, when you... I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, Flatbush Avenue. And, okay, I, and I never, perfect. I never knew my father. So, um, okay, so you you're talking it, to the right like, guy, but that uh, yeah. this is a productive conversation because so many people need to hear this. You so know, many people, people, people right, who are well, going so through many... this now, you know, go ahead, please. 100%. I want to shut that up. Happens. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> No, uh, I mean, my my dad had a whole nother family when I was brought into this world, um, you know, that we didn't know about. He left at six months old, you know, was still in my life. I loved my father. He passed away in 2019, um, was my best friend. But I think as a child growing up, you're like, why is my dad not here all the time? And that affects you as a kid. You know, I remember asking him, like, why weren't we enough for you? Um, even though he's still in my life, right? Like loves me dearly, supports me. I love him, but it's like those questions come up as a kid and you, they affect you whether you want them, wh whether you want to believe it or not. Um, but it's the, the self-evaluation that comes into play of like, why is this happening? And this isn't something that I even thought about until, you know, the last couple of years. And then it goes to, you know, generational trauma of like, what situation was I born into? I was born into a situation where my dad had a whole another family. Maybe I was an accident. I wasn't supposed to be born. Right. And so then there's those psychological things that maybe you pick up from your mom, which that's a whole, you know, some people don't believe in it, but my mom's pregnant with me and maybe subconsciously doesn't want me. Then what is that? You know what I mean? So Every... no, finish, no, please. Ahead. Cause that have, was that was it. I have so That's much I want to say about this, and there's so much to unpack about it from your personal experience and and um, what people think on a, on a, on a general level in regards to childhood trauma. 
Um, and I will start by saying this, because if I don't say this, we can't have a conversation. Childhood trauma is real. Yeah. Okay, period. I don't care what, what your doctor says. I don't care what the preacher man says. Kiss my eye. Tra childhood trauma, I'll, and where's my camera? Childhood trauma is real. And, and the reasoning behind this is you're not just growing physically as a child. You're growing psychologically as a child. Yes. I'll give you an example. There, there, from a scientific standpoint, there's a, there's a layer, a cortex above your head that's, that's in charge of mediating your impulses. Like someone cuts you off, you tell yourself, I could just kill that dude, but you don't because that part of your brain's like, that ain't right. <laughs> okay, I, I ain't gonna kill me. You know, I just wanna give him a three piece and a soda. You know, I wanna pop, you know, pop, pop. Um, yeah. Now, if you're abused physically, this is just a different example. If you're abused physically and that part of your brain's, da brain's da damaged and, and you physically grow up, that's a boy interrupted right there. That's a future serial killer or, or someone kidnapping someone, right? Um, if you were abused by your piano teacher, right? <laughs> and then a month later, you start failing science. You, you start failing in academia. It seems like one, ha one thing has zero to do with the other. And, it's, and when I grew up in the 80s, they're like, you know, what does one thing have to do with the other? Back then, it's nothing, and now it's everything, because right. now we, we just understand things better. We just understand, understand things better. Um, one little story, then I'm giving you back the floor, because this, I'm, I love this conversation. I'm, sometimes I get so excited, everybody's like, one of the biggest complaints about my podcast is, dude, you got to let your guests talk. <laughs> uh, um, um, but Silence of the Lambs, you ever see that? Yes. All right. So for the people that have not seen Silence of the Lambs, Clarice Starling is an FBI rookie, an agent that was assigned to interview a, psychi a psychiatrist who um, is in the, what, a psych ward because he was a cannibal. They called him Hannibal, Dr. Hannibal Lecter, can Hannibal the cannibal. They warned her, just the questionnaire, don't, ha ha don't answer questions from him because you don't want that guy in your head. All right? right. So what happened was she was, uh, I guess closing in on catching a, a killer called Buffalo Bill. How am I doing so far, right? Yep. Um, and he had information, but he says, you have to tell me something about yourself. And then I'll give you information. Quid pro quo, Clarice, right? What's, you know, what's it going to be? So basically her story was she stayed with her uncle that would slaughter lambs. And she couldn't take it. So she tried to rescue one of the lambs and she ran away with it. And the uncle brought her back had her sent away and they ended up killing the lambs anyway and she still has she was having these nightmares they just kill, kept killing the lambs or when she can't and it was and it was um she couldn't sleep at night thanks for sticking with me because you already know all this so but the through line of the movie is do you feel like if you catch buffalo bill the serial killer in which i have information um that the lambs will stop screaming and her answer was i don't know <laughs> and he said Thank you, Clarice. Because, and the point of that through line is, it wasn't about just coming up with immediate answers to, to um, make yourself feel better. Oh, that's it, you know? <laughs> you know, because yeah. that's what we do today, right? We, we, we're looking for symptoms and be like, I got that, I need this drug, right? Um, Jen, do you go to sleep at night and wake up the next day? <laughs> yeah, I got that, I got that, <laughs> give me some drugs for that. So, uh, um, um, what we need to do is constantly pose the question. And as we continue to come up with answers, whether the same ones or different ones, we understand each other better. And if um, we call it retrospective action theater, looking back in your past uh, and understanding or even confronting your past that allows you to go on with the future. All right. That kid that was abused by that piano teacher was me. All mm. right. I was, an, I was a straight A student. And then my mom's like, what's the problem? Why aren't you going to school? Why, what, you know, what's this? And I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. And I wasn't, able, I wasn't able to confront that until decades later. You know, military service helped because military got my body and a lot of my mind right about being on time and doing this or whatever. But understanding mm -hmm. it came from theater, you know? Yeah. I was, and then 33 years old, went back to school. You know, I was a 4.0, <laughs> like my first two years. <laughs> and I put volleyball on the shelf because academia, you know, because uh, in New York, yeah. no one's hiring you without a BA or BS. You know, now now the BA or BS is exactly that, BS. But, but yeah, you know, you can't apply online for anything unless someone says, ask if you have a bachelor's degree. So um, 
And where was I going with all this? This is why I shouldn't talk. <laughs> this is why I shouldn't talk too much. But no, but the, the point of the conversation you were having about childhood, childhood trauma, um, I was just trying to echo your sentiment in the longest way I knew how <laughs> to say to say we get you. We yeah, and I thank you for sharing that because mm -hmm. I know that's. I mean, it's like weird to talk about. You don't want to talk yeah. about it, but I'll, at the same time, it's like it's so empowering and healing yeah. to understand why you do the things that you do. And I just think so many people go through the patterns and the escapism today because they it's hard to look in the mirror and be like, damn, am I the problem here? Like, am I the person that is creating this chaos in my life? Because I'm not able to sit down and really sit with myself and be like, oh, uh, it's because my father didn't love me or because my father had a whole nother family or he was gone or, you know, mom, dad, whatever the issue. Because um, then when you figure out where it stems from and it, it's usually childhood, right? Like that's where it comes from. Because it shapes your personality. Because, yeah. Sorry. No, I was Sorry when it wait what'd you say no i said it shapes your personality and i'm yeah, like yeah. she's talking right now go ahead <laughs> no um just when you figure out where it comes from is when that's when the change happens and it it's hard and it sucks mm -hmm. but it's so it's so empowering you know and you it stops affecting your life mm -hmm. i think you're right in the sense that most in most cases that trauma comes from betrayal Right. Like for me with the piano right. teacher, the piano teacher, um, my parents didn't believe me. Mm. My mom didn't believe me. My mom thought I was lying because I didn't want to play piano. My dad, who at the time was my stepfather, was like, um, look, if what you're saying is true, I have to do something about it. So how sure are you that it's true? And my dad's like 260 pounds and probably would have murdered this dude. So I'm like, I can't. Do I tell my dad it's the truth, <laughs> you know, and be responsible for someone getting killed? So, uh, um, so there was a an, an an inherent betrayal from my mom, you know, yeah. that that in your childhood makes creates a mistrust, right, yeah. in yourself, like you said, like and, and other things. So, and I don't even yeah. know why we went this route, but this conversation was important too. And I'm glad. Thank you for um, I don't know. Thank you for allowing us to go that route. I appreciate that. Whatever is flowing right now is supposed to flow, and that's what I trust. Yeah. So. Good. Well, you can trust me. I, I mean, all the wacky things anyone can say about me, my integrity is not for sale, you know? Yeah. I would be the king of California if I if I was, if I could sell out. Do you do you know how far I'd be right now as far as like color commentating and things that I want to do? Do you do you know how how, how, how much of the king of the world I'd be right now if I, if I if I wasn't so stubborn with some some things, you know? And I don't know, peace of mind. Sometimes peace of mind has a price and sometimes peace of mind's not for sale. Peace mm -hmm. of mind should never be for sale. Oh, don't know about that. Yeah. You disagree? In some cases. Let me tell you something. I was coaching juniors in Anaheim, California, right? It's only an hour drive. I stayed at a hotel because the traffic, the parking, and all of that stuff, missing the, my Buffalo Bills game, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? The NCAA finals was Saturday. I paid a bunch of money for peace of mind. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but I mean, in the sense of like, peace of mind should be a non negotiable. You got to do what you got to do to have the peace of mind. You said, don't mess with me. <laughs> <laughs> I understand that. That is, you're getting peace of mind. But you should never sell it to anyone else. I anything. mean, no, no, bringing it back on a serious note, 100% correct. No, it's not, it's to me, it's not for sale. Uh, and to you, it shouldn't be for sale. That's yeah. what we're saying, right? Yeah. Yeah. I was I was messing with you a little bit. And you when you picked it up, I couldn't stop laughing. Absolutely. You're, you're not. like, you're like, oh, I know what he just did. <laughs> 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 oh man. Fan question. Um, where is the sport going right now and where do you want it to go? That's that's so loaded. Uh, um, where is the sport right now? We're 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 a sport that's losing more money than we're making it. We have two big tournaments a year to make to so people can can you know uh, um w uh, dwell in nostalgia. Like Manhattan Beach looks like the yeah. tournament that saves volleyball every year, and then we're right back where we started from every year. <laughs> okay, that's my opinion. <laughs> and you, as yeah. an active player, don't have to. You're not required to answer that because these are people that you have to work for and run with as an independent contractor or an employee. So, you know, me. 
No, I'm I'm good. <laughs> I'll I'll ca look. I carry that water for both of us. If that's if that is not or your sentiment. So, no, we're not answering that question. Another fan question: Advice to kids coming up. What would you tell some kids coming up to you? You're signing their ball, right? You're taking a picture with them, and you, you know you're in you're in that moment that makes you comfortable or not, right? <laughs> um, I want to be like you, Jen Ketty. How do I become a good volleyball player? I'm 14 years old. I would tell them to have fun as long as possible. Have fun as long as possible. I think it it gets turned into a job so quickly nowadays. Like mm -hmm. you're eight years old and it's you're doing all volleyball. You're doing one on one lessons. You're going to club practices. You're going to beach practice, indoor, high school. It's just it's so much. Have fun as long as possible. Nice. I like that question do you pay attention to the beach rankings i think before a tournament i do <laughs> i wonder if, are, i mean like these these gaps between it anyone sitting there staring at it for a long time i i don't what <laughs> try and trevor's number one? Oh, okay <laughs> i'm not kidding you i'm gonna sound like a total fool but i do not even look no not a fool. I don't even look. Not a fool. You're a dork. <laughs> I'm a dork. You and and I know you wear that 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 badge with pride. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> you are. My wife's a dork. Uh, uh, um, I I wish I was a dork. <laughs> I wish so. I was good. I was worthy enough to be called a dork. I'm not even. Um. So where else? What else? What other question? Places you need work. We did that. All right. So good. So let's finish with a 60 second lightning round um random questions quick answers let's get this sorry let's oh get gosh. this oops let's get this minute there's my 60 seconds and uh-oh where are they i don't have the questions don't have the questions please don't do that all right there i would be mad if you didn't have them i know at this point right all right <laughs> She got me. <laughs> We're not even close to even. She got me that time. <laughs> All right, and here we go. Um, last good book you read? Anatomy of the Spirit. Nice. Favorite comedian? Kevin Hart. Oh, nice. Marvel or DC? Marvel. Pool or beach? Beach. Lord of the Rings or Harry Potter? Lord of the Rings. Ice cream or cupcakes? Cupcakes. Favorite venue you played in on the sand? Manhattan Beach. Favorite place you visited overseas? Prague. Prague, so beautiful. Um, one person you'd like to meet, past or present, dead or alive, just to, just to have a conversation with them? Oh, my dad. Nice. One person you'd like to kick out of present or past because of, <laughs> it's so annoying. Oh, the devil? the devil <laughs> nice <laughs> that's right lord give me the strength to fight back oh give me the Three, strength two, and <laughs> boom we did it <laughs> the horn is honked and that is the near end of our podcast but and i guess the last question is people want to know more about you is there an ig handle or a website people are like i want to be like jen ketty when i grow up or or she's she's this fine looking woman how do i get to be down how do i get to know this woman uh, i'm i'm looking for a, a um a block a hit woman for hire or just people want to know more about you any um is there a particular website or you have an ig handle for your for your fans and i speak i swear to you i speak for so many that you allow to take the journey with you you wear your heart in your sleeve man I, i'm gonna say that again you, you, oh you for really sure my ig handle is genuine waters because i want to show up as genuine and as authentic as possible that's your own and business too right it's my business you go to my instagram you will go on a journey for sure tell them about the water thing really quick uh it's a medical grade water machine that produces living water and basically returns your body to its original state of optimal health Ladies and gentlemen, thanks to Jen Ketty, we are slowly becoming immune to old age. Absolutely. Old age. I, I know how old you are, and I'm not saying it on camera because I'm an old school gentleman. I don't talk about a woman's age or her weight, all right? Um, <laughs> that makes me sexist too, all right? 
<laughs> I'm 50, but I'm 52 years old and I don't look 52. I look like a, a creepy 35. Um, you do. <laughs> right? I creepy agree. 35. Hey, little girl. <laughs> Help! <laughs> Help! Help! <laughs> yeah. All right. Look, we. I'd love for you to come back on because I, I felt like um, there's so many other things we need to talk about, but because um, I'm a B student and doing my homework and not an A student, um, I'm... I'm hoping at some point you'd like to come on in the near maybe over the summer let's let's have let's For chat sure. again you know maybe even when you're in Hermosa I live here in the Manhattan yeah. Beach we could do an in-studio thing and that by then I'll have my production team ready this 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 thing is taken off and I'm really I'm yeah. humbled I'm humbled that great players pick up the phone and say yes you know From yeah all levels too right all the way up to Sharif to Holly McPeak and just Dane and all the all the great people I had on sorry go ahead yeah I am honored to be one of those people. And yeah, I would love to come on. And in studio would be that'd be a cool experience. So Yeah. But I'm here I'm an open book. Come with a tank top. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Eric Baranic would be the first one to tell you it is boiling in this place because of the, oh, the lighting. Okay. The lighting in the studio. Yeah. yeah. That's speaking of guys who wore his heart in his sleeve and a lot of the fans that take a journey. Remember him in two thousand nineteen with mm -hmm. him and Bill? That's that would be if you if you want an appreciation of what I'm talking about as an example from the qualifier all the way to the semifinals with Bill Kalinske. Yeah. That, that, that was a journey that he allowed to take. All right, so let me tell you guys something. Jen, Jen Ketty might love you, but I don't love any of you. In fact, I can't stand any of you. So for all of you at home, for all of you on your desktop, who runs the world? Old school, baby. For all of you on your iPad or iPhone on the lunch line at Starbucks, for my homie Jen Ketty, this is episode 150, 160 of the Option Podcast. I'm Jason DeBeas. Stay with me. I'm going to hit my music and we're out. Come check out the Option Podcast on optionvb.com. It's also available on iTunes and Spotify and on YouTube under the NY Varsity Sports Handle. You're going to love what you hear.